What is up, everybody? This is the Wild Nutrition Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Heskett, and this is episode 47. Today's guest is Brian Fitzsimmons. He is a coach who has done in-person training and has transitioned, like myself, into the online space and focuses on women over 40, kind of like myself, and he loves talking about simplifying nutrition and fitness, which we are going to do today. His background is that he played football growing up, he competed in men's physique just like myself, and then started the online coaching space. So we're going to talk a lot about nutrition today, a lot about simple fitness tips, and how this applies to uh, women over the age of 40, but anyone over the age of 40 as well will benefit. So without further ado, let's get into it with Brian. What's up, Brian? What's up, Chris? How's it been going since Coaching Con? Oh my God. It's yeah, I still feel like I'm absorbing the info. It's dude, there's it's so much info. <laughs> so much <laughs> stuff to implement, so little time. Exactly. I always go back to through the notebook. It's like, oh shit, I forgot about this and this. I, I need to implement that, or it get, gets up loaded onto Asana. It's like, okay, that's gonna go like next quarter. We're implementing this thing. Exactly. <laughs> All right, Brian. So tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Um, you work with mostly women over 40, which is going to be a large part of the, my audience based on the Spotify mm -hmm. analytics, but um, <laughs> how I, there, it's creepy how accurate some of that stuff is. But know, right? uh, tell, tell the audience a little bit about you and how you got into coaching. Yes. Yeah, so, um, yeah, my clientele is mostly moms over 40. And the reason I got into that is because like my first job ever as a trainer was actually in what was basically a curves. <laughs> it's like the, they call it get in shape for women. It's based out of Boston. And let's just say the training wasn't that great, but I love the women there. And I love the, like the atmosphere and working with that clientele. Then the next gym I joined just so happened to specialize in training people over 40. So just enhanced my skills from there. And like nine years later, started my own thing. So yeah, uh, that's where I'm at right now. Just uh, online coaching, training people in person and trying to help people live their best lives and be there for their kids and their kids' kids. Awesome. So I work with mostly women over 35. So it's kind of like the same audience we're speaking to, which is going to be awesome. Um, so you grew up playing football, which is what got you into fitness. Oh yeah. But let's be real. Most guys, like we get into it because we want to look good for the girls. Yep. Same, <laughs> same. Yep. <laughs> so you did men's physique, which is the same thing I did. Nice. Same reason, like want to look good for the girls. And then you're like, wait, that's going mm -hmm. a little too far. Yeah. Yeah. We all push it to the extreme and we're like, all right, this is no fun. <laughs> how long, how many uh, years did you compete? I only did uh, two seasons. So I did okay. like one show the first season and then the second season I did two. One was just like for shits and gigs because I like because my friends were doing it at the same time for the NPC, nice. which is the untested federation. Mm -hmm. And I'm like the old, I'm like one of the few natty guys there that's like, I'm just going to see what happens. <laughs> and then the de uh, the week after I did uh, OCB, which is tested, yes. they lie detector you and piss test the winners. So it's legit. I did the opposite. I started with OCB, did mm -hmm. that uh, two shows with them. And then it was, okay, well, I want to like maybe turn this into a real thing. I did one NPC show. I was like, this is not my people. I'm out. No. When you see the people that are enhanced, it's like, holy crap. I feel like I'm at the zoo. Yes. Well, just the, I find like the culture. I was like, I am not yeah. about this culture. It's just very very weird a lot of egos in the back a lot of <laughs> egos and stage at least the, at least the competition i was at there was a lot of like it almost came off as like self-hatred <laughs> like people yes. just like were not kind to themselves at all like the mental health in that room was very low <laughs> you're getting a bunch of people who are hangry dehydrated and yeah mental health at all time low like the worst it could be right at the show and talk about food fixation. That's literally and all anybody can talk about is that food, that first meal right after the show. <laughs> yes. My, uh, my brother and I competed together and, uh, he was obsessed with watching, um, man versus food. 
Oh, that's so good when you're in a when you're in a cut. Oh my god! <laughs> and then after the show, he's like this light switch. Like a week after the show, he's like, "Why the fuck am I watching this? This is disgusting." This, sh-. but like in it, he's like, "Oh my god, I wish I could eat all of that." He's just like watch it twenty four seven in college. Like, like, dude, yep. what are you doing? This is like torture to yourself. But in a way, it satisfies that part of your brain that's like, it I does. just want to go off the rails. Yeah, it, you're like on this thin line. Uh-huh. Um, which I think is what a lot of women end up doing. Um, I know right now, so I'm gonna like literally last week of my cut and I drop, I'm like, I just want to get done. So I like drop my calories to an aggressive amount. So I'm like in a thousand calorie deficit and my food fixation is ridiculous right now. Like I, I just ate breakfast not too long ago. I'm still hungry. I'm like, yeah. all I can think about is lunch right now. Like I can't wait to get to lunch. Um, yeah. I think that's a problem a lot of women get into is like the first thing they do is like, I want to drop this way as quick as possible, dump my calories to 1200 and like you just get fixated on food 24 seven. And it's like, yeah, that's cool for if you have a show coming up, like I'm going to stand half naked in front of an audience, but not cool. You got to push it. I mean, yeah. if you're going to be putting yourself out there, <laughs> not cool. Um, if you're like going for like, I don't know how many weeks, like how many weeks are you dieting? Most women go into not having a number. Yeah. Um, I know the ladies I work with, like how you say you're like looking forward to lunch. Like they'll put it off like every little thing for their yeah. kids, every job thing that they have to do. And then right at dinner time, it hits them like a ton of bricks. Like, yes. holy crap, that hunger bomb. Yeah, the hung- that's real. I have that with my clients too. It's all of a sudden it's like put off, put off, put off. Boom. So what do you do to help your clients realize that's a real thing and then work through that? Well, I like just testing them out and just being like, why don't we try getting a breakfast in? Even though like, cause a lot of people do skip it. So like, I'll say what we want to do is get some protein in here. So like, I'll go a little unconventional with that. Like I love recommending things like uh mighty muffins, for example, they're like a gluten-free, like just add water, microwave it. And it's okay. like a protein muffin. That's got like 20 grams of fiber or 20 grams of protein, not fiber, <laughs> but it's got like eight grams of fiber in there too. So they're super duper full. And I'm like, just try that and then see how much better you feel at night. And they're like, well, why am I not as hungry at nighttime? I'm like, because now you have that steady stream instead of nothing. And then everything. Yeah. hundred percent. So that's one of the, one of the big ones that we work on. Um, Do you get, uh, do you find you struggle with women coming home and they're like running to like the peanut butter, the hummus, the like cheese and cracker boards? Yeah. It's basically whatever their vice is. Like we all have ours. And I mean, I know people go off about like, oh, I've got a sugar addiction or sugar is my problem. It's like, no, no, no. That's the delicious stuff. Like when we get stressed, when we've had a hell of a day, we go to those foods that we absolutely love, whether you're a salty or a sweet person or a savory, like whatever you love, you're going to go directly for it. So for me, all the above. (laughs) Uh, I'm more of a sweet, but yeah, it's definitely like I could go any direction there. Um, so is it just like building awareness in that first phase of like, let's see like how we can get past this hunger bomb and this food fixation you have at the end of the night. Is it just building awareness there basically? And then they kind of realize on their own that, Oh, I feel so much better when I actually eat food throughout the day. Yeah. Like, cause my first phase, we call it discovery. And that's pretty much like we do what should work. And then we realize what the holes are. So like, we'll get them into a healthy calorie deficit, not a 1200 one. And then they're like, okay, well, this is more manageable. I feel a lot better. And then we plug up the the hunger holes throughout the day where it's like, all right, I get hungry around this time. And it's like, okay, so what do you eat before that? And it's usually like breakfast or lunch. And it's like, well, I eat nothing. And it's like, okay, so that makes a lot of sense then. So why don't we do that? Or adding in water or things like that, that just make the whole process easier hmm Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So what's like, you said your first phase discovery. So what do you do in discovery? Like, obviously we're probably similar approaches with yeah. our coaching. Um, but what does your process look like? Someone comes on and they've been struggling for years to lose weight. What do you do? That's different. 
Yeah. So, I mean, when it comes to a lot of coaches, I know, especially the coaches we know, like we'll, th they'll just throw them right into a uh, reverse diet, which definitely has its benefits. And it's definitely one way that works. I just prefer like letting people like see how they respond to what should work. So mm -hmm. I'll put them into the calorie deficit right away and then tell them, Hey, listen, we're just going to run this and then see how your body responds. And then we'll know if the reverse diet makes sense and we got to build your metabolism back up because maybe the yo-yo dieting and the 1200 calories have done a number on your metabolism or some people are really just lacking consistency and accountability. So the second they get the perfect plan, it's just weight loss, bang, right away. They're feeling amazing and they're off to the races. So it's just one way to not have to like waste too much time doing something they might not necessarily need, but like I said, there's benefits to every which way, but that's like the way that we do it. I kind of do a similar approach. I'm like, okay, first two weeks, we're just going to see as kind of same thing. Like, is it just like you've never built any consistency and now you lose weight or now your metabolism is pretty fucked up? Yeah. Because right. I mean, to be fair, like some people do have messed up metabolisms yes. and I'm not a fan of saying damaged or broken, but like, let's be real. We've competed. Your metabolism adapts. If yes. you eat less, you're going to burn less calories. If you eat more, your body's going to learn how to burn more. So you just got to pick which direction you want to go in based on what your goals are. Yeah. So can you explain what happens with, um, metabolic, well, the real terms metabolic adaptation, but yeah. what most people assume is like a damaged metabolism or I have a slow metabolism. Can you explain that process and then how you get people out of it? Yeah. Cause I mean like what a lot of people kind of associated with, which I mean, has some truth to it is like starvation mode. And when it comes to starvation mode, it's basically like, let's be honest, if you're in like a POW camp or you're on a deserted island, you're probably stressed to the gills. You have everything working against you. You like from a hormonal standpoint should be putting a lot of weight on, but you have no food. So you're going to lose weight. It happens on every like outdoor game show, mm -hmm. like naked and afraid. One of my personal favorites, like <laughs> great show. Every single contestant loses weight because it comes down to energy balance. But to get back to your original question, like if you're at a state, if you're in a state right now where you've been eating 1200 calories or you've been doing super restrictive dieting where it's like you're doing the whatever GQ or Vogue put out that week and you're on the wine diet or the egg diet and that drops your calories to like below a thousand, your body's going to respond and adapt and slow you down. And the way that that happens is not necessarily just like magic. It doesn't just like stop working. It'll slow you down in ways like you're not going to be fidgeting it as much at your desk. You're not going to be like opting for the stairs over the elevator. You're going to be making these micro decisions and these little differences in your day that your body's going to make you not want to do. Now, some people can push through that and keep their steps and everything, and they could still do pretty good with that. But most people are not cognizant of that. So they're burning less calories. They're eating the exact same amount of food. And they're like, what the, f <laughs> like, what the hell <laughs> you can curse here. All right. So yeah, they're like, what the fuck? <laughs> so um, should have asked that to start because I, I will occasionally do it for emphasis. So, but then on the flip side of that, like when we do the metabolic restoration, like your bot, like a lot of people don't realize your metabolism is flexible. It is adaptable. So if you eat more, you're going to eventually your metabolism is going to say, okay, time to crank it up. And then you have more energy to do those things and to be more active without even having to think about it. That's like what happens a lot of times when people get into reverse diets and they lose weight mm -hmm. because you give them just the right amount of calories. And then their body's like, oh, I'm firing on all cylinders. I'm going to do a little more walking. I'm going to take the stairs more. I'm going to do this and that. And they're fidgeting at their desk and they're like, I'm losing weight, eating more calories. So that's kind of what happens. And then eventually you hit that point where you're raising calories and ideally slowly to mitigate fat loss along the way and give your body a chance to catch up. But once you hit that certain point where you can maintain body weight and you're eating a shit ton of food, that's like the best case scenario. And then when you go into a fat loss right after that, like a fat loss phase, you're primed. So even though you were only burning body fat on like 1200 calories before run a reverse diet, now you could probably lose body fat at like 1700, 1800 calories, even faster and more predictably. Yes. Yep. And so obviously women over 40, like they probably had 
two to three decades of this fucked up sense with like fucked up relationship with food where every magazine's terrible. Like you look at women's health or like you said, Vogue, anything like that. It's like lose 30 pounds in 30 days. Also how to make this 2000 calorie cake that you'll eat in one sitting at the same it's time. Amazing so, how the magazines play those mental yeah. gymnastics. It's, it's weird. So a lot of women just think that they hit 40 and it's this magical like red line where it's like a death sentence for fat loss. Like I hit 40 menopause time. I will be fat forever. So what do you do to like overcome that other than going through the reverse diet or getting someone to actually like commit to the reverse diet? Cause I find that's something sometimes like I really have to walk someone through once they trust the process, it's they're fine. They're like, Oh my God, why did yeah. I never do this? But they have to trust it first. I actually just had one of my clients like just finish hers and I shit you not. We were on the phone, if not once, twice a week, just talking her off the ledge because when it comes to doing a proper reverse diet, it messes with your head so much because you have these brief spikes in weight and then it levels out. And the average person is like, Oh God, I'm gaining weight. I'm gaining weight back on a diet. Yep. So, but, um, so yeah, it definitely helps having a coach for a reverse diet, but other strategies, like when they hit 40, like, let's be honest, it menopause does play a role. Like our, their hormones are not in a good place where it's primed for fat loss. That being said, it doesn't mean that you can't back to the deserted Island prison POW camp. Like you will lose weight at a certain calorie range. And it's all about raising that metabolic rate as best we can through lifestyle factors. Like getting sleep right, which for the menopausal crowd is so, so difficult. And it's a very challenging thing to do, but it, and it makes the whole process harder. So managing expectations also plays a role, like saying, listen, we're not going to be burning two, three pounds a week, like a 20 year old, but if you stay consistent, it will happen. Just not at the rate that we're expecting. Yeah. So like uh, sleep strategies play a big part, um, stress management. So for a lot of people, when it comes to the stress, like we can control exercise factors, like making sure they're not overdoing it in the gym, making sure that the step count isn't something ridiculous, or they're not going on crazy long runs every single day. But at a certain point, like sometimes family stress and other things like that get taken into account. And again, comes down to managing expectations. Like if you have to take care of your parents for like three, four days a week and it stresses you out and you can't get to the gym, let's not expect some biggest loser numbers come way in time. Right. And it's okay. It's just, it is what it is. And for some people that also does include like getting professional help outside of our scope, like a therapist, because that mm -hmm. like therapists are worth their weight in gold. Yeah. I've, I've referred clients out to a few therapy clinics. Like, yeah. uh, what you need, I can offer you like these, yeah. these things, like I'll do one-on-one -on -one calls with you, but you need to deal with this. And, but it's different. Like if some, someone's thinking like, uh, do I need therapy? Do I not? When you have someone else tell you like, no, I can't help you. You need this other professional. They're like, oh, okay, I'll go do that. Yeah. Cause what we can do is like prescribe like acute fixes. Like we're basically like like how doc, like the bad doctor is only treating symptoms. Like that's kind of like all we have control over is like the symptom management. Like if you're stressing out in the moment, we could do like some breathing techniques, or if your mind is constantly racing, we could do some journaling or like I call them mm -hmm. like brain dumps mm -hmm. and stuff like that helps in the moment. But if it's chronic, if it's something that keeps resurfacing, like we're not equipped for that. So that's where a therapist comes in. Yeah. hundred percent. That's like I do a lot of mindset training with my clients, but sometimes all of a sudden stuff surface comes to the surface after decades of a poor relationship with food. And then it's like tied to your mom being a shitty mom and way back. And it's like, yep. okay, this is out of my scope of practice yeah. legally. Like I can't officially cross that line. <laughs> Go, I'm going to refer you out. And then uh, I'll work with your therapist as much as I can to like figure out what's the best like move for you moving forward. But yeah, there's when we're dealing with food, definitely that stuff pops up a yeah. lot or and even gotta, just exercise. I got to say, thank God for Molly Galbraith on like the information she puts out there yes. on presenting that to people. Because when you, when you tell somebody, yeah, you should see a therapist, they're like, fuck you. <laughs> like, so it helps having the, the art of being a coach and being like, 
Hey, I, I really would love to help you out with this, but I'm just not equipped. Like, have you ever talked to a professional about this? And it's just a nice way to bring it up. But like, it's, it's so nuanced the way that like people have to go about this problem because sometimes that stress is like something that's that immediate, like, nope, don't want to talk about it. Don't want to talk about it. Fuck you. Leave me alone. So it is tough sometimes. Yeah. I've had a couple of clients and you, the ones who follow through, they usually send me a text a um, couple of weeks or a couple of months later, like, oh my God, thank you so much. Like this totally changed my life, changed the relationship with my husband and my kids. And yeah, like, I wasn't doing it to be, get you out of my hair. Like now we can actually like move forward with your stuff. Like I'm just here to help yeah. you. Cause it, it builds buy-in, like it builds consistency because like one thing I talk to my people about a lot is like removing the nails from the tire. Like if you have a nail on the tire, eventually it's going to go flat and eventually the car is going to break. So if a stressor in your life that needs like a therapy set, like a therapy, I'm sorry, therapist to walk you through it and help you make sense of it and deal with it in the best way possible. We're taking the nail out. Now you can fill the tire up even more so you can run a longer race. Yes. hundred percent. And for the, the listeners, Molly Gabriel is uh, one of the co-founders of girls gone strong, which is amazing. If you're not following them, make sure you go give girls gone strong, Molly Gabriel a follow. Um, and then um, Jen, the other co-founder is Jen. I can't remember her last name because she changed yeah. it after a divorce. Um, yeah. Girls Gone Strong is just an incredible website with tons of great resources. Yes, yes definitely. I want to get um, my assistant coach certified through them in the near future. Um, yeah. So uh, with your clients, now they're like ready to lose weight. Like if they go through the reverse diet, their metabolism's firing on all cylinders what's the next step for them? Like what, what do you do to get them like losing weight now? Yeah. So wherever that maintenance point is that we brought them up to, I'll chop like 500 calories from that. And this is assuming that we have a healthy level of activity because like for anybody that isn't aware, like you have your basal metabolic rate and then you have whatever your activity is. And then that factors into how many calories you can burn and uh, use throughout the day. So this is assuming they're working out two to four times a week and doing their steps. So I'll take like 500 calories away from that goal and then make a range of 500 to 700 calories from that goal that they fall within. So like if they were doing say 2,500 was their sticking point where they stayed the same weight, everything was good. We'll go from 2000 to like 1800 calories and say, if you fall within that range, we're good. Nice. And then we just build the consistency of hitting it over and over again and making sure that like the weekends and life events aren't getting in the way of that. And for the listeners, if 2,500 calories just freaked you out, <laughs> I, <laughs> most women that I reverse diet, I'm sure for you too, like on the absolute lowest, like someone with extremely low activity levels, lo low body weight, like they're like four, nine, it's like 1800 at minimum, but usually it's somewhere above 2000. Like if you, you can't maintain your weight above 2000, generally you need a reverse dive first. I've had exactly one client right now that has had to go to 1200 calories. And to put it in perspective, she's five feet tall, 110 pounds. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if like we're pushing like that 180, 200 mark, like a lot of, a lot of women are at that kind of range, then we should be in that 2000, 2,500, possibly 3000. Like I had one woman who had, has had two kids. She's I think what, 35, 36. We got her up to 3000 calories without gaining a pound. That's awesome. That's a ton yeah. of food. I know. I just kept raising it. I'm like, are you sure the measurements are right? Like I take that back. She gained weight, but it was like muscle, be but the inches, like the circumference didn't change at all. So the body fat gain was like pretty much nothing. And I'm looking at these measurements like this does not make sense. But like, I was just kind of like, fuck it, let's ride it. So it's something to be said for individual differences between people. So then her starting diet was 25 to 2300 calories. Yep. That's loot. So listeners like realize you could be losing weight at 2500 cal like some people 2500 so but a lot of times like it's 1800 that's a lot of the women I work with their weight loss starts at about 1800 calories like 
not yeah. 1200. They might end their diet at 1200, but they're starting up at 18, um, which is huge. Cause a lot of times people think like slash get as low as possible and then they get stuck. Yep. Yep. Um, Cause you have nowhere to go from there. No, no. Um, Cause you have to, I think a lot of women don't realize like when you hit that plateau, as long as you're being consistent, usually plateaus happen because you like got cocky and you know, you're not tracking as much. Um, mm -hmm. But if you hit a true plateau, then it's like, you got to pull calories. Like at that point, calories drop. Well, if you're already at the bottom, you can only reverse that at that point. Yeah. Yeah. You always need something to take away. You want something in your back pocket just in case. That's why like when I tell the ladies like how they're lifting, like you always want a little something to give. And it's the same in the diet. You want to leave a little something in the tank. That way there's always a little bit more. You don't want to just push it to the max because clearly that shit doesn't work. No, no. There's a very like, we have a masochistic like view of dieting where it's like make it as miserable as possible. Like I'm going to do keto on 800 calories and eat nothing but like avocados and uh, butter. Like that sounds awful, yeah. but nope. That's the direction everyone wants to go instead of like, maybe we just do like, you know, 1800 calories and just not cut out any food groups. Nope. Not flashy nope, that, enough. That's not sexy enough. Sorry. <laughs> I, I can't like post on my Instagram that I'm doing this just like easy diet and I'm getting success with it. I have to like, so, like whip myself in the back like um the guy uh did you ever watch uh national treasure where it's like a was, monk yes whip, like that's how as like, soon as you said it i had that vision in my yeah. head like yeah <laughs> yeah that's what we do with it uh, a lot of people do with dieting and exercise like i'm gonna do 800 calories keto and then hit workouts six days a week like what the fuck and as professionals we hear that and we're like well if you want to fail that's a really really good idea yeah you're going to get burnt out and give up in about six weeks. Yes. Yeah. It's that yeah. magic and it's six not, to eight week mark. Yeah. And it's not because we think our method is like perfect and it's the best thing out there. It's just, we've been on the phone with people or like spoken with people in person that have done these approaches. And it's just a line of people that are frustrated and stuck and worse off. Yeah. So what does your fitness, like the training aspect of your program look like? Yeah. So that actually recently has changed a little bit because I've been always toying around with like, how can I get that? Like with the ladies, like this is a generalization and there's definitely people that break the mold, but on the whole, most really struggle with pushing themselves hard enough. Like, mm -hmm. because there's that fear of getting bulky. There's that fear of hurting themselves, which is totally justified because I mean, that's what you've been hearing for years and years and years. So it makes sense why you'd fear that. But like the people like now going on two years of the business, I have like people that have been doing it for two years and it's like, well, they're not bulky and you're on week one. So you're fine. <laughs> but like one of the things I do from a training perspective that changed recently to kind of get in that mindset and understand what heavy enough is, is we'll do like one main lift on the day A and day B. We'll I mean, I have a two, three, and four day program, but we'll we'll talk about the three day. So the day A and day B have one main lift. On day A, it's a lower. On day B, it's an upper. And what we'll do is five plus in is how I put it down. So first set is five reps. Second set is five reps. And then third set is as many as possible. And if you can double it, then you increase weight next time you come into the gym. So let's say you hit 10, you cap it there. So even if you could go for 15, 20, 30, you stop because as like beginner lifters, because our training age is not our biological age. When your training age is really low, you only need like 40 to 60% of your one rep max to get results. So we can kind of take it easy in that beginning, as long as we're increasing and getting comfortable with using heavier and heavier weight. And eventually we hit that point where it's like, all right, I can't get 10. I got eight. And I'm like, good, go for nine next week. And then we're really only pushing like a 10 out of 10 effort for like maybe one or two weeks. Yep. And for those of listeners, not sure what a one rep max is, that is the most weight you can lift for one rep. Mm -hmm. So, um, I use or a sim. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. 
I use a similar approach. I like the, uh, I got this from like Paul Carter, like 812 eight. Um, so like you find what you can do for eight, you stick with that weight till you can do it for 12 reps. And then you find what you can do for eight. And it's kind of like, that's great for all the like accessory work. So that's how like, when do I need to go up and wait? When you can do it for 12 reps, that's when you go up and wait and find something you can do for eight reps. And you just repeat that forever. Exactly. Because it's simple approaches like this, like the concept of progressive overload that are the reason that really dumb people can get some incredible results in the gym. Because if you push it and increase weight over time, you're going to build muscle. It's just a matter of fact. And then if your goal is to burn body fat, that muscle makes it that much easier. Yeah. And when you're pushing your body in the gym, you're forcing your body to adapt. You're forcing your body to recover. So it's sending like your metabolism increases because it has to recover. So it's sending nutrients, sending energy into the muscles to recover itself because next time you're going to push it even more. So it makes fat loss so much easier because your, your body's constantly in this state of adaptation rather than like go to the gym and I got a great sweat and a great workout and like, cool, you got your heart rate up, but did you actually push your body? And that's where I think a lot of people get with like hit workouts. Like they're really hard and you might leave the floor dripping sweat, but you've used the same 30 pound kettlebell for the last eight weeks. Yeah. Yeah. And that happens to so many people. They get attached to a way of exercising and they stay with the exact same weights. And they're like, these are my weights. And they're almost like, it's almost like an identity. I remember running group classes in my old gym and people would grab the exact same weights. And I'm like, well, I mean, based on this method of training, which we're doing like interval style training, they probably can't go up because they can't do it. So that's why strength training is primarily like the bread and butter of the results. Because when you're doing these things that your limiting factor is your cardio or your muscular endurance, it's harder to go up in weight and keep that same level of output and your form and all of that. So proper rest periods for strength are like bar none, best thing you can do for your overall metabolic health. Yeah. But even with cardio, I find a lot of people get stuck in like, I run a 10 minute mile for three miles and that's all they do. Yeah. Like, okay, your body's going to adapt to that. And now it's, you're not going to get results. I remember having this conversation years ago. She's like, I don't know why I used to lose weight so much. I go out, I run. And I think it was that exact same thing, three miles every single day. And now I'm not getting results. Like, well, you have two choices, either run it faster or run further. That's your two options or both. Um, yeah. because you have to force your body to adapt. It's adapted to the stress. Like if I was going to go and squat hundred pounds, like, cool, that might be hard on week one, but week eight, it's no longer hard. Like you said, now you're doing like yeah. 10 plus reps. And back to Back to Paul Carter, like one of the best things I picked up from him was the um, trade off when you go like too far in one direction. So, like the running example, if you run it faster or longer, what's the fatigue put that is accumulated from that? And is it worth it? Like, is that going to get you the results that you want? And are you recovering enough to actually adapt from it anyway? Yep. And when you're trying to lose weight, your ability to recover is diminished. A lot of people don't know that, but eating less food, less nutrients, smaller ability to recover. So if you do too much, you can go into overtraining and that's where injuries or burnout or you end up getting sick. Like those are the three options in overtraining. Burnout, like those, injury, sick. Like those people that are always dieting and they're always dealing with nagging injuries because yep. they never have enough calories to even recover their, from their injuries in the first place. Yep, exactly. Um, and a lot of people don't realize like from a hard workout, it takes like 48 to 72 hours to recover. It, people think they go to bed and like, I got my seven and a half hours of sleep. I'm recovered. Like, no, are you sore? Yes. Are you kind of tired from yesterday? Yes. You're not recovered. Yeah. The only people that could realistically pull that off are teenagers. That's pretty much it. Yeah. And even then it's not ideal. No, it's not ideal. Just because their hormones are like the best in their life ever. They can deal with that. But I did that as a teenager. I'm not sure about you, but I did that. And mm -hmm. I had shit results. Well, the way our program was set up in our lifting program for football was like upper one day, lower the next, and you bounce between the two. So we were kind of good on that. But even though like 
when you hit that one week where Monday, Wednesday, Friday was lower body and we were doing five by five squats every oh. single time. Talk about feeling dead. Like everybody hit a certain plateau and then we'd hit the off season and not touch a weight. And then we would come back and go figure we're weak for like a week or two. And then bang, we're hitting PRs because of that rest. Yeah. But when we're on it and doing it consistently over and over again, it's so much harder to make progress. I like using, so because you said that, I like using this analogy with my clients of like every athlete has a season, but every soccer mom thinks they can just go ham like year round. Like no athletes, like you have your preseason, you during the season, like that might be your fat loss phase, like preseasons building muscle, your reverse diet. Then you have your actual season and then post seasons, like now we need to recover from that shit. Mm -hmm. But every soccer mom's like, nope kettlebell workouts six days a week one hour plus i got my yoga three times a week go like on 1200 calories like no like maybe we, we need to eat more food to recover from never mind yeah you're not gonna I, listen to me yeah when it comes to that whole top talk it's tough but honestly like i love the dan john uh, example have you heard of his seasons of lifting um I love Dan John's thing. I'm not familiar with his seasons of lifting. Yeah. So I'm probably going to butcher it because I know that there's more to it, but the general consent or the general idea is that like there's different points in the year where your training should be different. So like in the beginning of the year, it's burning body fat, like getting ready for the summer, getting your body in that good shape that we all want to, I mean, let's be honest. I mean, we're all vain to a degree. We want to look good <laughs> yep. on the beach. So that's like what that first, like, third of the year is. And then that second third is the summertime. That's where you do more outdoor stuff. That's where you like are basically in maintenance and you're just enjoying yourself, like doing all the fun things of summer, having a few drinks, going to the pool, going to the beach, and you're not really stressing about exercising. You're doing just enough to keep the results. And then once that's all done, then we get into the winter and that's prime time for building muscle, getting stronger and like going into a little bit of that bulk. And then you kind of follow that cycle and it lets you live life in a really comfortable way and get incredible results. Yeah. I, so didn't realize that came from Dan John, but I explained it to my clients the same way. Like I always explain. So my seasons revolve around hunting season, which happens to be the fall. So for me, it's fat loss in the, the early winter because nothing's fucking going on. Like everything's dark, dreary, and cold. So it's like, what else are you going to do? Let's lose body fat. And then it's <laughs> might like, as well. might as well. Um, and then it, you're going to go into like late spring, early summer. Um, but that's kind of like either you're trying to build muscle or what, exactly what you said, maintain. Like let's just enjoy summer. You have summer vacation, stuff like that. And then we go into fall where mo more often than not, we have holidays and more family stuff going on. You have, especially women over 40, probably have kids. So you have a lot of school things going on in the fall. So you're probably eating more calories and we can either fight against that and struggle, or let's just use that to our advantage. Let's build some strength, build some muscle. For me, fall's hunting time and usually I'm working out less. So I'm like, okay, great time to like, get like three days in, build muscle, build strength. Same thing. I'm probably going to put on body fat because I'm going to be in deer stand cold and not moving <laughs> for a couple, like eight hours. So yep. I'm just going to do that. And then come January 1st, I just start my diet. Yeah. I see that bow behind you. I, yep. It looks like a pretty legit bow. What's the weight on that? That one is not my hunting. Bow. That's the first bow I ever shot. Um, so oh, that one's okay. maybe only like 40 pounds. Um, my, the actual hunting bow is upstairs in the uh the garage but that's a 70 pound bow gotcha because i saw that uh pic that video of uh schwartz doing it on joe rogan and the way he pulled it back and was like oh god i'm like that would be me <laughs> well rogan has like i think an 80 or 90 pound bow which is ridiculous like yeah. it, he only has that because he wants it to be that it doesn't <laughs> need to be that it's heavy. it's a straight up flex there is no it like is. actual benefit it's so just like exercise, there's a diminishing curve when it comes to like the weight of the bow, because the arrow actually has to support all this energy. So you need like this thicker and heavier arrow every time you go up and there is some benefit, but it's just that diminishing curve, like from 70 to 80 to 90, like it's very, very little. It's just a flex, um, yeah. for my area, like the minimum 
poundage, like my wife shoots like a 40 pound bow, 45, I think now, but it's like minimums, like mm-hmm. 35, like that'll kill a white tail deer deer is 35 pounds. You don't need a 70 pound bow. No. And it kind of sounds like the example they give with baseball. Like when I, I grew up in a really big baseball town and okay. one of the key things that the coaches would always say is like, when you go and get your bat, just remember lighter bat, faster swing, more home runs than a heavy bat that you can barely move. So go figure the one year I finally listened, got the most home runs ever. <laughs> Cause you're able so, to like actually swing it. Yes. Yes. And to bring this full circle, this plays right into nutrition and fitness too, because there is a state of diminishing returns on pretty much everything that we do. It comes like, I use the example all the time with my clients with uh, exercise. Like I really push for that two to four times a week, be in the sweet spot Mm -hmm. because when you push it too far, your body fights back hormonally, you are in a shit position. Like your body just is fighting to stay alive. It's not really thriving to steal something from a uh, Casey, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, yeah, like if we're pushing pedal to the metal, eventually we're going to run, we're going to run out of gas and you really got to find the sweet spot. It's about doing the right amount, not the most. Yes. Yes. Um, like how I did that, the, that was, that was spot on. Um, but yeah, the, I'm the same way. I'm like two to four times a week is perfect for most people and their schedule. Like you'll get amazing results with two times a week. You'll get faster results with three times a week or four times a week. Five times a week is like, mm, you're not going to get any faster results. Yeah. Like that's great. If you're chasing like very specific, like fitness, like you're trying to improve your endurance for something specific, but you need, like doing four times a week lifting, like very specific goals, but not necessarily like faster fat loss or muscle building goals. Yeah. And when you look at like some of the best programs of all time, like we're talking strength training being like the bread and butter, the best thing you can do when we're looking at the best strength training programs of all time, like five, three, one Bulgarian method, uh, juggernaut, all these programs are three or four days. It's not five, six, seven days a week. No, no. But people think that, well, I'll just, it's a do more mentality. Like yep. some is good. More is better. I'll get faster results if I work out every single day. Like mm, your body's not a forklift. Yeah. And I feel for this, this generation, like the 40, 50 area, because they grew up in the prime time of the world's shittiest nutrition and exercise information. <laughs> yes. Like to, to their credit, like it's not their fault. They just were subjected to being the guinea pig generation where people were doing their best, trying to figure out what the pieces are. Like Atkins thought that carbs were the problem. And then like, or uh, sorry, the fat was the problem. And then the keto people thought carbs were the problem. And then they're just trying everything. Like this is the magic formula. This is that, this is going to get me the results. And here they are years later, like, well, this thing kind of worked for me in the past. And like, I think this will work again. And they're just on this hamster wheel of no results. Yep. Yep. It's full circle. Like keto was found out decades ago. And it's like, here it is again. Like, why is this coming full circle? And people are like, oh my God, have you heard of the keto diet? And like, <laughs> you, you know, that's like 40 years old. Like, yeah, it's been around forever. I love telling people about the white rice diet. <laughs> like oh, the people that are yeah. convinced that carbs are the enemy. Look at the white rice diet and look at some of those transformation pictures. Like they have absurdly like some of these people lost two, like two, 300 pounds eating nothing but white rice. By the way, we then, don't recommend that. <laughs> no, no. But there was a wean off protocol where they incorporate more protein, more vegetables and like all that stuff. But to get them the results in the beginning, like some of the before and after pictures are mind blowing. Like they put biggest loser to shame. Oh, wow. White yeah. rice. I mean, bland food not super high in calories. Like as long as you're not dousing in soy sauce. Yeah. That's going to work. Exactly. Exactly. There's as long as you're not frying it, like you're yeah. fine. You're just doing steamed plain white rice. Like, yeah, you're not overeating that. You're going to get sick after like two cups. Oh yeah. It's like those studies they do with fruit. Like the, I don't know if they've ever replicated it, but I know there was one out there where they like basically calculated everybody's calories and they're like, here it is in fruit and gave them a bag of it. And they're like, go eat it for the day. And one of two things happened. One, they came back with half a bag and they're like, I can't do this. And then the other half came back 
empty bag and they're like, I feel so sick and bloated. Like never make me do that again. But fruit's the enemy. Fruit, oh, fruit's fruit, toxic. It's going to kill you. It's Didn't you hear? Kill you. It has sugar. So sugar's bad. It's going to kill you. Yeah, I, had I literally on. just put a post up the other day and it says like verbatim on a PubMed that basically all health organizations recommend fruit to improve all cause mortality risk and to live a longer life and to lose weight. So if that doesn't tell you these people are full of shit when literally like every medical community is saying, no, it's good for you, then now had- you can just unfollow those people. I had uh, someone argue with me on like, I love doing those posts just to get engagement on my social media. So I had someone arguing with me, no surprise. And then she started listing out sources because I was, she's like, fruit's going to be bad. Not only will it cause you to gain weight, but it'll also cause like tooth decay and all these other issues. I was like, fruit. I was like, are you talking about like excessive fruit consumption, like a fruitarian diet? Yeah. But like eating like Two servings of blueberries in a day is not going to cause you to gain weight. A banana a yeah. day is not going to cause you to gain weight. So she tries to like quote medical research and every single one's like excessive fruit consumption. And I like, she's like, uh-huh. are you going to argue with these doctors? I was like, well, n- it's making a point against you. Like it says excessive, which I said, yeah, we're not talking excessive. We're talking like eat a banana a day. That's fine. Yeah. She's like, no. Well, what about this one? Same fucking thing. Like you have no idea what you're talking about. Please never give nutrition advice ever again. She's like, I've been in the weight loss industry for 10 years. That's scary. That's a red flag. Like weight loss industry is a weight. If you're not saying like nutrition or coaching industry, I'm like, weight loss means you're selling dumb shit. Mm -hmm. Red And they're probably listening to whatever quote unquote doctor is on staff. And let me tell you, I date a doctor and not all of them are great. Like, like we'll, we'll have discussions about, and she'll tell me like, you're not even in the medical field and you know this. And I'm like, yeah, it's kind of sad because just because somebody is really, really smart in one area doesn't mean that they're bright in all areas or the, or that they're able to acknowledge their bias. Right. That's the biggest problem. A lot of people have these gigantic biases, but their ego is so inflated that they can't say, Hey, uh, my personal opinion, it's like based on what I think. No, it's, this is a fact. And it is because I say so. I'm a doctor. I wear a coat. Um, I love, so whenever someone challenges me on this, like, well, a doctor says this. Um, so this is something you can look up right now. You can look up the PDF for the Harvard medical school, their curriculum. Like it's online. You can go look it up. You know, what's not on there. Any nutrition. There's no nutrition classes required. Um, there are good doctors out there who go and get nutrition training, but if they just kind of go the route and just stick to their specialty, they're never going to get any nutrition training. And then people go to them like, Oh, my doctor said this, like, sorry. Like when it comes to fitness and nutrition, they're no better than a high school health class. Yeah. And let's be honest. If you go to your cardiologist, they're going to tell you to go plant-based. If you go to a nephrologist, a kidney doctor, they're going to tell you to limit your carbs. Like it's almost guaranteed that these certain specialties are going to apply their thinking to the general population when they only work with disease states. So when you are not in that but in that bucket of people that is in a disease state, a balanced diet and checking off normal boxes, like making sure that we get under 2000 milligrams of sodium a day, or making sure that we get enough protein to support your training because the RDA for protein is like half of what the actual person actually needs to properly adapt from strength training. Mm -hmm. RDA means you're not deficient. It doesn't mean it's the best. (laughs) Right. People don't realize that. Yeah. Yeah. They're like, oh, if the RDA, no, that's like, so you don't get a deficiency, not optimal yeah. deficiency. Yeah. And that's the, and that's the thing too. Like, uh, like again, like the fact that I'm dating one is a huge advantage and I understand the other side of the coin. Like, to be honest, if you're going into your doctor, they're making sure that you're not going to die. It's not, let's optimize your health. It's, are you going to die right now? Okay, good. Get like, you're, you're fine. Like you do have to take a little bit of responsibility for yourself and say, okay, my box, my doctor checked off all these boxes. I'm good. Now I want to take it to that next level and take it a proactive approach and do the best I can. So that next time I go in, I'm even better. Mm -hmm. 
my wife's a nurse and she comes home with horror stories about nurses because nurses are just as bad of like though okay. like no spout, matter what profession there's bad people in all of them <laughs> there's there's but they have no nutrition training but they'll give like um one person i i'm not gonna obviously say names but one person was trying to get residents to like go keto it's like what 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 she was telling them like don't eat these foods don't eat these foods meanwhile like their dietitian on staff was like you're going to kill these people who need need to eat calories like you're going to kill them end up she ended up getting fired eventually but yeah they don't have any formal training like they don't actually have any training but then because they're in the medical field people automatically assume like they know everything about everything from like virology to immunology to like health and nutrition like no they know their specific field like and the the other thing that does help like frame all of this is that what we're talking about right now and all the advice we're giving and the people that actually take this advice are in the minority of people okay because most people when they go into a doctor's office and their doctor says you got to eat more vegetables they will not do it now, right. you could argue about like, oh, well, they didn't give them enough like actionable tips and whatever. But let's be honest, people barely take medication that saves their life. Like you really think they're going to be taking nutrition advice? No, just accept that you're in the minority and that's not what the doctor is for. That's like why people shit on BMI for active individuals who have a lot of muscle mass. They might show up as obese and they're, they are a little bit different than most people. Now, when you look at the general population, it does apply and it is very helpful. Yes. Yeah. Um, speak, speak. what doctors have to deal with, like, again, non-compliance is just a real thing. Like we deal mm-hmm. that, with that with coaching. Um, but I remember, uh, were you at coaching con last year? I was not. So it was, uh, Dr. John Berardi from precision nutrition, his last ever like in-person speaking event. Damn it. So he showed, um, he's like, okay, so if we present people a magic bullet, like they take this pill, they get results. They will lose weight. They will take muscle people. Everyone's looking for this. So he's like, So there's actually research done on this. He's like, there was a magic bullet. It was on a heart, like taking heart medications to keep people alive. Like they suffer like major heart attack. If they don't take this medication, they will die. Compliance was 50%. Like there's the magic pill. Like it's a life or death medication and compliance was only 50% with this research done. So doctors deal with this all the time of like, they have these patients that they want to help and eat more vegetables, move more. And then every day, like next time this person comes in for the physical, guess what? Now they're even heavier. They haven't done anything like that takes a toll on a person after a while. Like, yeah, at some point they're going to be like, okay, I guess we're going with Ozembic. Like you want to take this pill? Like you've been coming into my office for 10 years, every year you're heavier. You haven't done anything really. Like you just yo-yo diet. Like yeah, medication. So I get, see where they're coming from a lot of times. And I, I may be in the minority of trainers, but as soon as Ozempic and semeglutide came out, I'm like, good, <laughs> this makes our jobs so much easier. But there's like this anti-medication rhetoric in the fitness space that's just toxic and it's not doing anybody any good. And I'm like, great, this makes our jobs easier. People will buy in more and they're going to be healthier because on average, what medication used to do is like result in like five to 10% of their overall uh, body weight reduction. Now we're up in like the 15 to 20% and yeah. that's life changing. Yeah. So the fact that that can improve somebody's life, none of us should be scoffing at it or avoiding it. If you're the person that actually needs it, it should, it's a tool in the back pocket. I feel like I'm like, okay, we should try everything else. And then if you can't lose weight, or we have some severe issues, then we pull it out. Like it's not yep. my issue is the people who are like on Facebook, like promoting it, like, go get it, go get it. Like, I just want to lose a couple pounds. Like I'm going to go on this medication. Like, no, we need to address lifestyle factors and things. When you come off my, um, one of my CSMs, she took it for a little while. Um, she's like, I did not address the lifestyle issues. And when you come off, if you don't do those things, all the way, it's going to come back on. So I'm yeah. with you. Like it's a great tool. It's way better than getting um, like gastric bypass or anything. Great tool. 
but it's a tool. It's not a miracle pill. If you don't address like your current lifestyle issues, like you're not exercising, you're not eating vegetables, not eating protein, it's not going to work long-term. Yeah. And I've had clients that got back, uh, gastric bypass and all the other surgeries like stapled stomachs and nothing works long-term unless you address the lifestyle habits. So when it comes to Ozempic or semaglutide or any of that stuff, it's like, you just gotta, like one of the things that I loved that, uh, Jason Phillips, our mentor goes into, like when he talks about different diets is like, it's not the diet. That's the problem. It's the application. So when it comes to like these medications, like it really comes down to what the application is. Do you want to just lose like five, 10 pounds to look good for a wedding? Great. I mean, I wouldn't say hop on medication for that, but if that's like your goal and what you want to do, then fine. Just acknowledge it's going to come right back. But if it's a lifestyle change, like you want to keep this weight off for good, you need to change all the factors surrounding your food habits. And if you don't do that, don't be surprised when all the weight comes back. Yep. 100%. And that's, I think in like six to 12 months, we're going to start to see that with some of the over prescription of just like giving it out too much and people just promoting it as a miracle pill yeah. versus the people who are actually realize what it is of like, this is getting things under control and now I'm losing weight. I, I actually have someone who, um, was, uh, she was taking it and she's like, finally, I'm like losing weight. I feel like I'm moving in the right direction. And now I can address because it's like the scale's going. So she's seeing the wins and now she's starting to address those lifestyle issues. It's like, okay, great. It was the breakthrough she needed to finally have a win in her life. And she'll need some work coming off of it, but it's working for her. Awesome. Yeah. And that's one of the biggest wins of this whole thing. Like my girlfriend has a, a coworker who's also a resident and she lost like 30, 40 pounds. And one of the first things she said when she said, oh my God, you look great and all this. And she's like, yeah, now I think I'm going to hit the gym and really lock it in. And I'm like, yes, yes. <laughs> like, that's awesome. Because even though it's not like ideal, like you'll hear people be like, no, you got to hit the gym day one. Like it makes no sense. Like it's reverse, whatever. But at the end of the day, screw being right. It's effective. Yeah, exactly. So starting out with, uh, I have some clients where it's like, we're just going to do like walking and like nutrition. We're not even going to hit the gym because they're so intimidated with the gym. It's like, okay, great. We're just going to get movement in and we're going to get this. And then they start losing weight. They start feeling more confident. It's like, I feel like I'm ready to get to the gym now. Like, awesome. All right, let's go. Like, yes. What exactly what you said. Some people will be like, well, no, force them to go to the gym, get in there. And that's like me at like 10 years ago as a coach, like I would have been that person like, no, you know, that's, they've had coaches who've tried to do that with them. And guess what? It didn't work. That's why they're here now. Let's address this. They're losing weight. They're getting closer to their goal. Oh, now they're confident in themselves off to the gym. They go on their own. And, it, and it's because like we, as fitness professionals, we're always putting these like targets out there two to four times a week, gallon of water, all this stuff. And people feel like, I mean, I try and do better with this, but I'm guilty of it a hundred percent where like, it really comes down to where you're at and what you need to do next. Because to your example, if you've basically been sitting on the, on the couch, like you go to work, do your thing, come home, sit on the couch, watch Netflix, eat and do nothing else. If you got a 20, 30 minute walk-in and made some minor nutritional changes, you will be amazed at how much weight you can lose just doing that because you don't have to hit the two to four times a week. You don't have to hit the gallon of water. You just got to get the big rocks taken care of and see where you're at right now and what will cause a change by implementing whatever it is, what that next step is. Yep. Yep. I have quite a few clients like that. So they come on, they're like super nervous. They're like, oh, what's week one they're gonna be? And then we do their onboarding, like, cool. Um, so just eat protein like three times a day, get veggies, you know, with lunch and dinner and a fruit at breakfast, and then walk. And they're like waiting, like, that's it. Yeah, that's it. Just do that for like two weeks. Like two weeks, do that. And then at like two weeks in, they're like, I think I want to start tracking. Cool, let's give it a try. But then the power is like they're coming up with it. Like they're deciding not like a coach being like, you need to track these calories. And they're like, I fucking hate tracking calories. It's like, no, yep. I think I'm ready to take it to the next level. Great. Let's do this for the next three weeks. Yep. And it's just layering. So yeah, I have a little bit of a similar approach there. 
Yeah. And I actually flipped that. Cause I mean, like I said, all these methods work, it just comes down to like, what's right for you, but like, I'll give them the calories and, or not even the calories. I'll just say track for a week. Mm -hmm. And then as a learning tool, and then yep. all of a sudden they're like, wow, I really don't get a lot of protein or like, uh, I don't really have any veggies in here. And cause when you track stuff, you want it to look good. Like we're all human. Nobody wants to put down. Yeah. I ate an entire pizza just by myself. Or like I had an entire tub of ice cream. So just that is like enough of a tool to be like an adherence tool where it's like you, you when you track, you un unconsciously eat less. Yep. Yeah. You will unconsciously do that. Um, I've also changed it to all these clients I get, they want to learn more about nutrition. I want to learn more. I want to learn more. And it's like, cool, track your food. Like, wait, what? And I was like, best way to learn about nutrition, what's in food, just start tracking the foods you eat daily. Wait, what? Like, you're not going to learn, like, if I give you a presentation, I'm like, I see the numbers of how many of you actually show up and watch my weekly open office hour mm -hmm. presentations. Like, it's not many of you, but all of you can track. And then they're like, Oh, I didn't realize peanut butter had this many calories. Yep, exactly. And I'm trying, Oh, that's what it was. As you were talking, I'm like, damn, I always use this example and I always forget the guy's name, but like that, it reminds me a lot of, uh, when I went to a perform better conference back, like maybe five, six years ago. And it's like a fitness conference, nutrition conference. And one of the guys, Nick Winkleman, one of the most famous strength coaches in the entire world is doing this like talk on running mechanics. And he's given us all this stuff to work on and everything. And we have a room full of like legitimately like 200 coaches. And he's like, all right, everybody pair up. So we have these long lines of people and he's like, all right, coach them up and let's see how they look. And right off the bat, 95% of the room was like, all right, you got to run like this. You got to pump your arms. You got to do this. And me and like maybe five other coaches are like, all right, run. And then he's like, all right. And then he's running and he comes back and I'm like, all right. So based on what you looked like, we're going to improve this, this, and this. And then Nick Winkleman just stops and he's like, all right, everybody back up, back up. All right. How is everybody going to coach if they don't know what the run looks like? Yep. And I'm like, I feel smart. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right. So we're a little bit out of time. Um, so let uh, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be on your podcast, Brian. So what's the yes. name of your podcast? My podcast is the Fit 40 podcast. Fit, like F-I-T, four zero podcast. Real awesome. simple. And then where else can people find you? Yeah. So I'm on pretty much all social media coach underscore fits with two Z's F I T Z Z. And I've also got a Facebook group called the fit 40 family where I just give away a bunch of free stuff and we have trainings and stuff, probably very similar to what Chris does. So yeah. Perfect. All right. So all that stuff's going to be down in the show notes guys. So if you want to go and follow Brian, make sure to check out the show notes. Uh, check out his podcast. Like I said, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be on his podcast and probably talk about similar stuff, but slightly different. Oh, we'll, we'll keep it interesting. I'm going to yep. bring up, I just saw you run. Now I'm going to figure out what we didn't cover. Exactly. Exactly. There's so much stuff. All right. So much. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for tuning into today's episode. Make sure to check out the show notes to follow Brian. Check out his podcast, which... Uh, as we just said, I will be on in a few weeks after this episode is released. Also, make sure to leave a review. Give the show five stars if you enjoy it and write out a review. This not only helps me create better content for you, the listener, but also helps other people find the podcast. Thank you so much. Till next time.